You know, one of the things that I find most bizarre about the state of planetary science at the moment is that despite all of the missions that we've sent to Mars over the years, we still know surprisingly little about how the moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos, actually formed. We don't know definitively how to resolve the different hypotheses. We don't really know what the moons of Mars are actually made of. But it's high time to rectify this. And to do that, it's time to send a sample return mission to Phobos. Finally, let's unlock the mystery. How did the moons of Mars form? So firstly, let's take a look at what we already know about the moons of Mars from the various missions we've sent to them over the years. The first photos of the moons of Mars were returned by the early Mariner missions, but it wasn't until the two Viking orbiters were sent to Mars in 1975 that really Phobos and Deimos were characterised in detail. In particular, in 1977, the two Viking orbiters returned some fantastic images of Phobos and Deimos. Now, the results from these seem to be suggesting that Phobos was extremely low density, around 2 grams per cubic centimetre. It's also an extremely dark body. It only reflects about 10% of the light that falls upon it, and it seems to be coated in a layer of very fine regolith, very powdered surface material. And in particular, when you put all of the evidence together, it seems that Phobos is compatible with a carbonaceous chondrite composition, which means that it's very similar to early meteorites and undifferentiated material that we see throughout the solar system, remnants of the era of planetary formation. So putting all this evidence together, it seemed natural to suggest in 1979, and you can check it out in some of the original papers listed down at the bottom, that Phobos seemed to be compatible with being a captured asteroid. Now, there were more missions that were sent to the moons of Mars in the 1980s, particularly by the Russian Space Agency, who sent Phobos 1 and Phobos 2 in 1988. Now, unfortunately, the Russians had a lot less success. Phobos 1, unfortunately, lost communication on the way to Mars, whilst Phobos 2 did manage to reach Phobos. It returned 37 images, one of them you can see there on the right, but communication was lost in 1989 with Phobos 2, just before it deployed its landers. Now, this was a real shame. It had two landers, one of which would have just been a stationary platform sat on the surface, whilst the other one was going to be a small hopper that would jump from location to location on Phobos. Because the gravity on Phobos is extremely low, it's about 5 millimetres per square second, so it's really easy to take off and land again. Now, since Phobos orbits extremely low, only 6,000 kilometres above the Martian surface, that means that even dedicated missions that you send to Mars can be used to also investigate Phobos, which is a huge advantage. So in particular, NASA sent a mission to Mars, the Mars Global Surveyor, in 1996 that launched two dedicated campaigns of trying to understand Phobos in 98 and in 2003. There was also the European Space Agency's Mars Express mission in 2003 that did three campaigns of trying to to understand Phobos in 2004, 2008 and 2010, and most recently the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter sent in 2005 had a further two campaigns in 2007 and 2008. And this is really important because all these spacecraft have different instruments looking at different windows of the electromagnetic spectrum, and it's by looking at an object all throughout the electromagnetic spectrum that you can really characterise it in detail and try and really get a handle on what's going on. But what we really wanted was a dedicated mission to Phobos. And this came in 2011, when the Russians were back with a vengeance. They decided that they were going to go above and beyond what everyone else had attempted by doing a full-on sample return mission. It was called Phobos Grunt. Now, unfortunately, although Phobos Grunt was an incredible mission, really, really visionary, it suffered an unfortunate launch failure very shortly after launching, which meant that it re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, which was a huge setback for the planetary science community. We would have had the samples back by now, and we would have hopefully finally solved all of these mysteries we still have about Phobos. But not to worry, let's take a look at what we've learnt about Phobos from all of these missions that we've sent. On the left there, you'll see an image taken by the high-rise camera on board the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Now, this isn't a true image, it isn't what you'd actually see with the naked eye, but what it really exemplifies is there seems to be two different compositions on Phobos. What's called the red unit, which coats most of the surface, and the blue unit, which seems to extend from Stickney Crater, a 9 kilometer diameter crater, which is the largest surface feature on Phobos. And if we take a look at the spectra in the visible and near infrared of these two regions, what we see is they seem to be slightly sloped towards the red end of the spectrum, but remarkably featureless 
with no really prominent absorption features. And this makes it really difficult to understand what Phobos could be made of. The orange line there also shows the spectrum of Deimos, which seems at first glance to be very similar to that of Phobos, both the red and blue units. So this tells us that whatever Phobos is made of, likely Deimos is made of the same material. So once we can solve the issue of how Phobos formed, it should also inform us about how Deimos formed as well. But recently, as recent as last year, it's been suggested that there are small absorption features at 2.8 micrometers and 0.65 micrometers, which in Freeman's paper has been interpreted as being consistent with a desiccated phyllosilicate composition, which basically means clay that has had its water content removed. Now this is really interesting because in order to form clays, you need to have the presence of water. It needs to undergo aqueous alteration. Now this could potentially happen if Phobos had formed beyond the orbit of Jupiter, where there is abundant water ice. However, there doesn't seem to be a water feature on Phobos. There would be a really prominent one at 3 micrometers if that was the case. So the theory could suggest that Phobos formed out beyond Jupiter, came in, got captured by Mars, and then after being subjected to space weathering from the radiation environment over billions of years, the water was all stripped away, producing the composition we have today. Now, in this theory, you would expect these phyllosilicates to be characteristic of the carbonaceous chondrite composition, which has long been suggested for Phoba since the 1970s. So we've seen that the early evidence seemed to be pointing quite strongly towards the idea that Phobos could be a captured asteroid, maybe from the outer asteroid belt, or potentially from the Jupiter Trojan asteroids around five astronomical units away from the Sun. But what other theories are there? How could Phobos have actually formed? The theory that's been knocking around for the formation of Mars' moons for the longest is called the Asteroid Capture Hypothesis. In this theory, Phobos and Deimos would have originally condensed from the planetary nebula in the outer part of the solar system before migrating inwards. Now, Phobos and Deimos would have had a close flyby of Mars, and at this time Mars would have had an extended proto-atmosphere left over from the disk that the planets and moons were forming from. Phobos and Deimos would have travelled through this atmosphere, undergoing friction, which would have slowed down their velocity enough to be captured into an elliptical orbit. They would then gradually lose energy, this orbit would circularise over time due to the action of tidal forces from Mars, until eventually Phobos and Deimos would be in their present day circular orbits. But this theory has some real problems. In particular, due to the low gravity of Mars, you require very, very precise conditions to get Phobos and Deimos captured in this way. And in particular, their orbits are almost perfectly circular and lie exactly on the equatorial plane. But surely, if asteroids were coming in at nearly any angle, there's no reason a priori for both of them to be exactly on the equatorial plane. And in particular, as Burns pointed out in his 1992 paper, it seems extremely unlikely that the coincidence would apply to both Phobos and Deimos. So potentially another theory would be required in order to resolve the problem of why they have their present day orbits. A theory that's been gaining increasing traction in recent years is called the Giant Impactor Hypothesis. In this theory, an object with a mass of around 2% the mass of Mars would have smashed into Mars billions of years ago, causing a huge amount of material to be ejected into Martian orbit, forming an accretion disk. Gravitational instabilities in this disk will then cause tiny little proto-moonlets to form, which will rapidly dissipate the disk, eating up its material, forming a number of little moons surrounding Mars. Now you'll see on this diagram that I've denoted two circular regions. The outermost, given by the dashed line, is called the synchronous orbit radius. If you form within this, you will inevitably either hit the Martian surface or be broken up due to tidal forces, which takes place when you cross the innermost circular region, which is called the Roche limit at 2.5 times the radius of Mars. Now over time, all these little proto moonlets within the synchronous orbit radius would head towards Mars, impacting it over time, leaving only two moons in the present day, Deimos, which is destined to fly away from Mars, drifting away from it over time, and Phobos, which is currently on an impact trajectory and will probably break apart around 50 million years from now. Now whilst this theory is attractive because it does explain many of the features we see on Mars, in particular we see that the northern hemisphere of Mars seems to be remarkable remarkably different from the southern hemisphere, which could be due to an impacting body striking Mars. Mars also seems to have an anonymously high prograde angular momentum, which could have been provided by something whacking into Mars. But one problem that this theory has is that, as I've mentioned, Phobos seems to have a carbonaceous chondrite 
composition. But if an impactor had caused Phobos to form, we would expect to see lots of Martian surface material, in particular material from Mars's upper mantle. So we would expect basaltic minerals like olivine and pyroxene, which have not been detected on Phobos. Now, you could resolve this by saying, well, maybe the thing that whacked into Mars had carbonaceous chondrite material, and that's just what we're seeing lining the surface of Phobos. But although this theory is attractive for many reasons, it does not seem to definitively resolve the issue of why Phobos' composition seems so strikingly similar to that of an asteroid, and not necessarily on bulk Mars composition. Now, interestingly enough, how are we going to break this degeneracy? How are we going to resolve the differences between these two hypotheses and finally understand which of these formation theories is correct? The simple way to do this is by using something called oxygen isotope ratios. The oxygen atom has three different stable isotopes, which means it has different numbers of neutrons. Oxygen 18, oxygen 17 and oxygen 16. Now, what is really interesting is that if you take some rocks, say from all around the Earth, and measure the ratio between oxygen 18 and oxygen 16, and then plot that against the ratio between oxygen 17 and oxygen 16, they all lie along a certain line. Now, interestingly, this line differs depending on the certain region of the solar system that you obtain the samples from. In particular, Mars meteorites lie on a line with a different slope and different intercept than rocks from the Earth and Moon, and also different from carbonaceous chondrite meteorites which formed elsewhere in the solar system. So the idea would be, if you can go to Phobos, get a sample and bring it back to the Earth and measure these oxygen isotope ratios, we will see a different result depending on which formation theory is correct. If Phobos is a catched asteroid, all of the rock samples we obtain will lie along the carbonaceous chondrite line. There will be no Martian material mixed up in there. But if the giant impact hypothesis is correct, we expect to see a mixture of Martian material lying along the Martian oxygen isotope line and also carbonaceous chondrite material lying along the chondrite line. So by looking at whether we have isotope ratios along a single line or along two lines, we can finally answer the question of how Phobos and by extension Deimos formed. So to obtain these isotope ratios, what we really need to do is to get a sample from Phobos or even Deimos and bring it back to a laboratory on the Earth with high enough resolution that we can definitively resolve these tiny subtle differences between these different isotope lines and be able to definitely say how Phobos formed. So how could we actually accomplish a sample return mission to Phobos? What I want to talk to you about today is what's been going on in the community since the failure of the Phobos Grunt mission, which has been dominated really by the European Space Agency. So let's examine the proposal. Currently set for a nominal launch in 2024 on board a Proton rocket, the spacecraft would transfer via a standard Hoffman transfer to Mars and go into a high quasi-satellite orbit around Deimos, the outermost of the moons of Mars first, where it would spend 25 days characterising Deimos. It would then transfer from Deimos to Phobos and afterwards eject the propulsion module once its fuel has been expended and spend 145 days characterising Phobos in detail with the suite of scientific instruments on board. This would be used to select the optimum landing site from a 60 km quasi-satellite orbit. Once a shortlist has been drawn up of different landing site candidates, the spacecraft would then undergo three close flybys at three kilometres in altitude to find a side on which site to land on. The spacecraft would then deorbit itself, descend to the surface, and spend a total of six days collecting 100 grams of material from Phobos. This material would then be loaded into an Earth return capsule on board an Earth return vehicle, which then ejects from the lander, leaving it behind on the surface of Phobos, where it can still carry on doing measurements on the surface. It then undergoes another Hoffman transfer back to the Earth, and in total it takes 2.7 years from the launch of the mission to re-landing in Australia, where the mission would be finalised and the capsule would be collected. There is also the option for an extended mission of 4.8 years, which would offer 490 days of orbital characterization of Phobos. Now, part of the reason why this is being pursued so aggressively is that this mission would do so much more than just answer the question of how Phobos and Deimos formed. It would also act as a precursor mission to future human missions to orbit around and even land on the Martian moons, because there are some real key strategic knowledge gaps required 
required for this. It could also potentially sample, I mean, if the impact hypothesis is correct, then by sampling Phobos material, we could actually be sampling Martian mantle from the early eras of Mars's history, which would provide some really interesting constraints for planetary formation. And even if the impact hypothesis isn't correct, if Phobos is potentially a trans-Neptunian object, which it could be if our current theories of planetary migration are correct, then this could provide real constraints on our current planetary formation theories. Here's a breakdown of the different stages on board the sample return mission spacecraft, and also showing which space agency under a joint European-Russian initiative would be providing each module. In particular, the pink modules are provided by the Russian space agency, based on heritage from Phobos Grunt, as well as the proton rocket that would be used to launch the mission, whilst the blue modules are heritage from the various industrial design studies that the European Space Agency have carried out under Project Footprint, which started um, seriously in 2012. Now, I'm sure a lot of you really want to know the full technical specifications of this. So in the video description down below, I've provided the feasibility study that the European Russian Space Agency has carried out as recently as last year. You'll find 250 pages explaining in detail how the mission works, all of the architecture, the actual hardware, how big everything would be, how the sampling mechanisms would work. You'll find it all in the video description. So I certainly encourage you to check it out. It's a fantastic report and I'm glad that it's in the public domain so that I can finally share it with you. Now I'd be really interested to know, based on the evidence as I presented it, which theory you suspect is more likely for the formation of Phobos. If you're interested in more of the scientific background and want to delve into the research literature, I'll post a selection of links down below to some various review articles that you could use to really brush up your level. It doesn't take that much effort to get to the research frontier in this field, which is one of the reasons why I've really enjoyed getting really to grips with Phobos sample formation theories. If you're interested in learning more about Phobos sample return methods, and about my own research endeavour to design a thermal infrared camera that could be used for landing site selection on such a mission, then please check out the featured video series Project Phobocam, which is down there in the bottom left. I hope you enjoyed this video and thanks for watching!